Howdy folks. So yesterday I was um, replacing the motherboard in my main home router uh, because uh, the old one was incompatible with a new network card I bought. And uh, the motherboard I upgraded to wasn't brand new. I mean, it was made in 2009, but it was newer than what was in there before. Anyway, I had this SSD, this OCZ uh, Agility 3 in my old router. And so I just went to install uh, PFSense on this as well. Uh, I thought I might as well reinstall it while I'm there just to make sure it's, you know, all configured for the new hardware. And the BIOS on that motherboard, which is the M3NHT Deluxe, does not detect this as a disk at all. Uh, of course, you can still, uh, within an operating system, communicate with it, but the BIOS will not boot from this, which I thought was kind of odd because uh, it's the only motherboard I've ever seen that that just doesn't doesn't understand this disk. Now this is uh, this is a SATA 3 SSD. It's 60 gigs and it's uh, one of the first generation SATA 3 SSDs. And uh, I've had this for quite a while. I mean, this is um, it's been in service for quite a long time. I think it only has about 30 something percent life left in it. So um, I mean, it's perfectly fine for a router. It doesn't get a terrible number of writes. But uh, of course I do run Squid, so I do want to put an SSD in there um, and have the, the performance from that, as, as well as the fact that, I mean, I want the reliability. Uh, I don't want to have a hard disk in there fail. I mean, I've got a whole bunch of old 80 gigs, 80 gig hard drives I could put in there, but I mean, those things are like seven years old and who knows when they're gonna crap out. So this is still more reliable than that. So anyway, uh, I was sort of in a rush and I happened to have one of these um, sort of lying around. So this is what I ended up putting in it. It's a 128 gig drive, which is absolutely ridiculously overkill. Uh, I think it only uses about 1% of the total space on the disk, even with uh, a sizable swap partition. So uh, definitely overkill. Again, it's also uh, it's also SATA 3, 6 gigabits per second. Uh, this is a much better SSD than, than this one. This one I think is only around 150 megs a second is what you can get out of it. This one you can get around 500 megs a second through it. I'm not going to do a performance get, uh, comparison on these. It's not really worth it. Um, but uh, anyone who wants that uh, key, you can totally take it. I haven't activated it. don't really care. So um, what I thought I would do, the reason why they rattle a bit is because they have no screws in them. I thought I'd open them up and see uh, see how much has changed. I mean, OCZ, or technically I'm in Canada, so I should say it's OCZ, but I don't think that's the way they want it to be pronounced. OCZ technology, I mean, they, they basically made such crappy products that they went bankrupt. And um, it'd be interesting to see these. Now, this, this product has actually fared quite well. And uh, I mean, mostly it was their power supplies and their, their non-memory components that really sucked. Uh, because they didn't make them themselves, they contracted them out and to the literally the, the lowest bidder end. Unfortunately, uh, they probably lost a ridiculous amount of money on RMAs and stuff. So, I just I, all I do is I remember going to their depot and standing in line with you know fifty other really annoyed customers getting replacement parts for uh, for all the stuff we bought that didn't work. So uh, they they weren't a great company in my books, but uh, Toshiba owns them now. So anyway, the first thing I noticed after I took the cover off is this. Just this metal plate is incredibly heavy. This thing weighs more than the entire rest of the drive by at least a factor of two. So uh, obviously you can make the drive smaller and lighter by getting rid of this. And uh, this, uh, you you'll notice how thin the metal is. So the other, the top is just plastic and there's nothing interesting about that. But uh, the main board here, uh, there, there are a few interesting things on this that you won't see on the other drive. First of all, the uh, the memory, of course, is, is double-sided. So they've got four, four uh, modules here and four on this side, and they've staggered them. So there's four on this, the bottom here and four on the top here, which is kind of interesting. Now, there are, of course, there's spots um, for a total of 16, eight on each side. And uh, if you look at the eight that are populated, this is a 60 gig drive. So what I'm guessing is these are eight gigabytes each, which yields a total of 64 gigabytes. And then because this is a 60 gig drive, that extra four gigabytes is used sort of as spare, uh, as spare sectors, possibly because uh, th this has a Sandforce controller in it, an SF2281V8VB1. Uh, and uh, 
from what I remember, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Sandforce controllers, uh, they have a way that you can specify in firmware, basically reserve blocks. And uh, that's probably what that four gig extra is doing. And uh, the A data, I know for a fact that A data, you'll notice this isn't a 120, this is a 128 gig. They don't have reserve blocks or they, they do it in some other way. And that's how they can squeeze that extra eight gigs out. Uh, I read an article a long time ago about how they did that. And uh, unfortunately it didn't stick in my brain because I don't remember it right about now. But uh, anyway, I mean, that seems pretty normal. Uh, the board is actually a, the complete size of the SSD which uh, is something that you usually only see in really high capacity SSDs nowadays. Because of course, you wanna get the board area down as, as low as possible. So of course, we've got our controller, we've got a crystal for that controller, which I may or may not be able to read the clock speed on. It's gonna be a PLL'd up, but... Uh, I believe that's 30 megahertz. If I read that right, which is a bit odd, but not completely unsurprising. We have a chip from a manufacturer. It's an L. It doesn't look like a lattice. P-O-W-R-607. Not sure what that is. We have another chip here, ATH1182 ECL. And another chip here, P119HN7R6. I don't recognize any of the manufacturer markings on any of these chips, uh, which is kind of interesting. But uh, the first thing that I notice is there's there really isn't any DC to DC on this board. Um, I don't see any big inductors. I don't see any... Um, any switching transistors for that kind of stuff, which is which is kind of odd because I would expect this stuff to be running uh, lower voltage than five volts because of course um, SATA the new SATA specification only contains um, five and twelve volts, so uh, I'm not entirely sure where they're doing the DC to DC on this uh, because I don't see I don't see any uh, components for that which you'll definitely, you'll see it in the other one. The, the, the big thing that really strikes me as, as odd in this is just the number of headers it has. It's got a, a surface mount header here. It's got another, uh, it's got a through hole header here, which is labeled 3 volt TD, O, TDI, TMS, T clock, ground. We have another header here, VCC, TX, RX, ground. And this one is the one that I'm interested in uh, because I have just a, a serial like USB UART cable. I'm going to try to connect to that and see uh, see what it spits out when I power it up. It's also got LEDs on the board, uh, a power LED and another one that says FLT, and I'm not entirely sure what that one is. The power LED is green, and you can see it actually through the case because when this is sitting in the case, there's a, a cutout here, and the LED just shines through the cutout. Uh, it's not every day that you see a drive with a, an indicator light like that anymore. Uh, that, that FLT light doesn't appear to flash when the drive is being accessed, so it's got to be for something else. There's other, there's two other chips here, they're both identical. EN6337. Uh, they've got quite a few pins on them, and I'm not entirely sure what they'd be doing. And there's pretty much nothing at all on the back. So, to compare this, this A data drive, which I mean, it is 128 gigs. It's an unfair comparison, but this is a relatively new model, the SX900. I mean, it came out, it's, it's within the last couple years. Uh, and the first thing you'll notice, of course, is that the board is relatively, quite a bit smaller. And of course, this is double the capacity. Um, so they've got uh, eight chips on one side and no chips on the other side. So they don't have the weird staggered configuration that the, uh, the OCZ drive did. Now, because there's eight chips and it's 128 gigs, that would mean that these chips have to be 16 gigabytes each, and that would yield the full 128 gigs, which sounds reasonable to me. But of course, the first thing you see, which is what I expected to see on this one, is you've got uh, you've got inductors, and uh, I mean this 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 definitely looks like DC to DC, which is what we'd expect for the memory. 
uh, which is just not present at all on this. This is also a SandForce driven SSD as well. I mean, a lot of uh, SSDs are uh, SandForce driven just because it's such a sort of a generic chipset. This is the uh, SF2281V2B in comparison, um, or VB2, sorry. Yeah, so pretty much the only difference is uh, this is the VB1 and this is the VB2. The crystal on this one, out of curiosity, it may have been 300 megahertz. I may have uh, completely messed that up. This one, this one is difficult to read. It's kind of smudged. They didn't stamp that crystal um, case very well. But uh, this has also pretty much no headers at all. Um, it has. Two, two holes here and three holes here and that's it they're not they're unlabeled and uh, I mean it has test pads of course it has a bunch of test pads here obviously for a bed of nails testing that they would put this on but uh, there's really uh, there's really no other headers like this also the amount of support circuitry that this board has is quite a bit less than this of course this has you know one two three four five sort of substantial sized chips whereas this one only has really one chip here and then these chips which are most certainly just uh, for the DC to DC so this chip here which is an incredibly small package um, it just says 8EDF141 so it's probably uh, I'll try to decode that but I'm not entirely sure how successful I'm gonna be but uh, yeah, I mean, this is probably five years, maybe, difference between the between the two. And uh, I mean, we've come leaps and bounds in SSD technology. But uh, I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to get out my my serial cable. I'm going to see if I can see what's on that that header, just uh, while I've got this apart. This was this was a random video. I'm not entirely sure where I was going to go with this, but. Uh, I thought uh, while I while I, while I was looking in here, I would. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get my cable out and see what's on that pin. So I just hooked up um, my Sailor Logic uh, analyzer to the uh, to the transmit on the serial port on that OCZ SSD. Uh, I found this was easier than trying to use uh, like just a regular serial cable and uh, something like Minicom. And the reason why. Uh, is because of the data that I received. So if you just look here at uh, the channel zero, which is the serial, you'll notice that uh, zero seconds here is when I plugged the drive in and I triggered. And you can see we have a pretty ridiculous uh, amount of data on this pin. Um, we're looking at like 2.7 seconds worth of transmission. And uh, I figured out the baud rate. Um, I've got an async serial decoder here, so it's just a 11.5200 baud, uh, 8n1. Uh, there's no framing errors in this, so that's definitely the correct baud rate. So it starts up, and uh, it just basically, uh, it's a basic a ROM load. So there's a bit of a delay in between some of these, but it gives a chip ID and uh, a ROM revision, December 20th, 2010, build 288571. And uh, a bit more data about the ROM, um, where it's loading it from. There's another date, July 20th, 2011, another build version. So possibly two ROMs here. Um, more text about loading a ROM. And then we start these blocks. There's this block, this large one here, and then these ones here. And these do not contain text. These contain um, just pure binary data. And uh, I've exported this as a CSV, and LibreOffice actually won't even import the CSV. It's got too many, um, too much text in a cell. But if you open it up in uh, gedit, and it's basically one uh, one row per byte is the way that it, it's exported. And so by counting the number of lines, um, there is roughly 26.2 kilobytes 
worth of data that is streamed out over this serial port. So I have no idea what this is. Um, it, it seems a little bit low to be the actual firmware itself. Uh, I would have expected the firmware for something like this to be a lot larger than that, you know, a couple megabits. So I don't know what they're streaming out. It starts out as text and then, uh, and then I have really don't know what this is. So if anyone knows what this is, uh, that would be, that would be pretty, it would be much appreciated. Um, what I'll do is I'll post the CSV um, on, uh, on my website and uh, if you want to take a look at it, you can just parse out uh, all the binary values from the CSV as to what this is. Um, what I might do is I might take this and uh, do that and then put it in binwalk and see if binwalk can determine uh, if it is indeed uh, some known image format. And uh, if it is, uh, that would be pretty awesome. But it just, it seems too small. So it could be proprietary debug data. Uh, it could be encrypted. Uh, honestly, I don't know. Um, it definitely starts out the way I'd expect it, but uh, it's it's not it's not like some of the hard drives, like Western Digital drives. They actually have sort of like a console, like a serial console that you can actually control the drive from. This is uh, this definitely looks more developer related. So um, of course that makes sense because this is a, a header on the inside of the drive. So what I might do is I might actually, while I'm out, probe the uh, the other header, the one, uh, the, uh, the the six pin header, and see what's uh, see what's on that. But uh, I'll uh, yeah, let me do that just quickly and see if there's anything on that before I uh, end this video. So I just checked and there was nothing else on the uh, the other header at all. Um, it seems that all of the pins are either tied to uh, ground or uh, they're floating at 3.3 volts. So uh, obviously that header is not enabled or activated and uh, there's probably some command you have to send for it to start doing anything. There wasn't even a clock, so uh, not terribly interested. Um, I, I can't really be bothered to uh, write a script to go through and parse the CSV file and turn it into a binary. So uh, if anyone wants to do that and then uh, run binwalk on it, uh, be my guest. Um, I mean, this is an old piece of technology. Probably nobody cares. Uh, it's probably nothing of use to any, anybody anyway. So anyway, I just thought I'd see what's on there. So uh, yeah, this was a bit of a random video. But uh, anyway, thanks for watching.